right, it's Father's Day, correct? All right, you dad, stand up with me. Come on, come on, fathers, let's get up. There you go, there you go, there you go. Give yourselves a hand. Yeah, it's tough being a father. Oh, I know, I know. All right, be seated, be seated. Of all the things I've done in life and failed at <laughs> and had success, nothing, nothing is more important to me than being a father, and I have been a good one. My children love me. Uh, my grandchildren now love me. Uh, they all want to hang around and be with me and do stuff with me. Uh, and it's not because I was this cuddly little dad, you know, who wouldn't, who, who wouldn't do that hand thing, you know, the hand of the father. Uh, and, uh, it, it, in fact, I was then more so than I am now, but I, sometimes even now, I'm the opposite of that little cuddly guy. I, I'm, I was tough. I was a tough dad. But, you know, they love me. And, uh, and, and they want to be with me. I'm unique to every one of them. Uh, to my children, I'm dad. To my oldest two grandsons, I'm aw daddy. A-H-D-A-D-D-Y. I am awesome. Uh, actually, Jack was trying to say granddaddy, and it came out aw daddy, so it, it kind of stuck. And it's the same way with my younger two, Bonnie's two. Uh, it was supposed to be granddaddy, and it came out do daddy. I think that's okay, too. I can do it. I'm, I, can, I think they're prophetic. I have influenced them all. I am a man to them, a man's man. I am a leader to them, a leader of our family, a, just a leader. So they respect all of that. I've influenced every single one of them individually in a lot of ways. And of anything that a man can acclaim to and feel success in, there's nothing more important to be successful at than being a father. I can say, I am a father. I'm not just a male. I'm not just a man. I am a father. And I'm a good one. With that boasting behind me now of myself, I want to move into what I want to talk to you about. What I want to talk to you today is specifically dads. What dads do for their children. There are ten vital lessons that dads need to teach their children. And I want to talk about these things. If you're going to have children that are going to be a blessing in society, that will have blessed lives, that will be a blessing back to you and blessed by God, then these ten things need to be taught to them and put in them in their lives. And Dad, you're the dominant factor. You're the one who's got to be responsible to make sure these get in there. And if they do, if you teach the, your children these things, then you will be blessed by your children. And your children are going to be a blessing in the society in which we live, but also they will have blessed lives, blessed of God. So let's get started. And since the book of Proverbs was written by a dad to give instructions to his children, his son, then let's prove this, what I'm about to tell you from the book of Proverbs that I'm going to be talking to you about. But not just prove it, but establish it. Establish it so that you will know that, Dad, this is what you do if you want to be a number 10 dad. Number 10 dad. That's what we're after, right? So let's look at the first one. What is the number one thing that you need to teach your children? Let's look at this one. Teach them to fear God. It all begins here. The, the verse in Proverbs says, in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning. The beginning, the beginning of what? Knowledge. Of knowledge. If you want smart kids, if you want kids that know how to do life and know how to handle stuff, then the fear of God is the, is the number one thing that you must teach them. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. We're going to talk about that too. Proverbs 9.10 says this. It kind of set, repeats it a little bit, but it's a, a different little thought. The fear of the Lord is the what? Beginning of wisdom. You want wise kids? Here you go. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You want them to understand how to, how to manage life, how to, how to get through life? Then, then this is where it, where it begins. It begins with the fear of the Lord. But not just fearing the Lord. I want to try to emphasize this. You need to teach them to fear your Lord. Fear your God. I, I, I taught my kids to fear my God because of the attributes that I taught them about my God. My God is powerful, and I taught my kids, my, my God is so powerful, he can do anything. My God is powerful. My God is holy, and he can't tolerate sin. In fact, in fact, what you've got to have if you want to have a relationship with God is that you've got to have the mediator, Christ Jesus, in your life. You see, Jesus is the way to God. 
He makes it possible so that each of us can have him. So you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He can't tolerate sin, but by the work of Jesus Christ, we can get to him. My God is holy. He can't tolerate sin. My God is omniscient. You can't get away from God. He's with you everywhere you go. Don't try to run from God because it's impossible because he's omniscient. He's everywhere all the time. My God is just and fair. He'll get you, though. (laughs) My God is merciful. He loves to forgive. My God loves you more than you love you. My God loves you more than you love you. My God is gracious. Uh, We have abilities and talents that are given to us by God. Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. He's talking about his abilities that he have, that he had. Now, all of us have the grace of God on our lives in that, in that God has given us attributes. You, my children, have gotten gifts and talents specifically that God gave you to have a great life. My God orders human history. All of history is built around God. My God is God. My God made the mountains, my God made the sea, my God made the dry land, my God created everything, and my God even created you. And so once your children kind of have that in their head, they begin to fear this awesome God. And that's the bottom word, that's the bottom line, is that you teach them how awesome God is. But however he gracious he is, and loving he is, and forgiving he is, my God, who will become your God, will get you. He will get you. He's gotten me, and he will get you. (laughs) And when he gets you, he's not just right because he's right to get you, but he has the right because he's father. He's father. He's the ultimate father. And you can't argue with him when he gets you because you know you messed up and you know you got it coming. You're trying to slide, but he's not going to let your foolishness slide or your folly slide. He's going to get every single person. (laughs) He will get you. He will punish sin, my child, even yours. Because he's punished mine. And so therefore, he's going to get you. I've watched him get some important people. I've watched him get some preachers. And I've watched him get some presidents. You're never too important to be gotten by God. (laughs) Right? Right? God is way big, way powerful, way fair, and way merciful, but my God will get you. (laughs) He will discipline you. Your child's got to learn, got to learn to fear your God, because if they learn to fear your God, your God will become their God. And that's what you're really after. Connected with the fear of God, and you know I can't go in the middle of a worship and praise him, worship him series without talking about it a little bit. You've got to teach your children not only to fear God, but to also worship him. If you don't teach them to worship God, they will worship themselves. Their focus will become on them, and they'll think they're the Almighty, and they are not. <laughs> and they need to learn and be focused to worship God. Your child must be taught this. Worship must be in the correct order. God first, and then you somewhere down the line. <laughs> And, and you got to teach them by to worship, by you worshiping. All of these, all of these things that I'm going to be talking about are, you can talk about them, but what they're really wanting to see is, do you do them? Do you worship God biblically? Do you worship God regularly? My kids watched me worship. Now listen, they heard me preach, but they watched me worship. They would see me do it biblically. I would come in here every Sunday and my hands would go up and I would jump and I would rejoice in the Lord. I would clap. I would shout. I really enjoyed the presence of God, but they also saw me on my knees. They saw me crying. They saw me having an encounter with God. Now today, it's nothing more blessed for me to do than to be in church with my children and look down the road and watch them with their hands up and watch them crying. And having an encounter with God. And I know they learned a lot of that from me. From me. Teach your children to fear God. Teach your children to worship God. Because if you will, your God will become their God. And that is the number one thing because all of life begins with the fear of God. So that's number one. What's number two? Number two is teach them to guard their heart and mind. Very, very similar in the importance area. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else. What does it say? 
Above all else. How important is that? Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Life springs out of your heart. Your life, the life you live, is coming out of your heart. Proverbs 4.23, the same verse, different translation, says this. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Again, important. Be, 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 be diligent about this. For out of it are the issues of life. Every issue your child faces in life is coming out of their heart. Every issue. And the heart is the person's idea. It's the core. It's who the person is. You can't get away from your heart. You can't escape it. You can't hide from it. It's you. When something gets into your heart, it becomes a part of you. It's your identification. It becomes, it becomes your, 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 your thought process. It gets into your mind. It gets into your purposed will. It gets into your emotions. It gets into your thinking when it gets into your heart. And here's the main thing. It becomes your future. Teach your children to be cautious, extremely cautious, diligently cautious with what they allow inside, with what they allow themselves to hear, to listen to, to what they allow themselves to be around, to what they believe, because what they believe is what they become. Teach them to guard their heart, because once it's in, it's coming out. It's going to come out in issues. It's going to come out in things of life. Jesus said, it's not what you put in, not what you eat, that messes you up. It's what comes out of you that really messes your life up. He said, he said this, Mark seven twenty. He went on, he said this, what comes out of a man or a person is what makes him unclean. Other translations say defiled. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery. And he goes on and on and on. What he says is it's coming out of you. Once it's in, it's coming out. And the father has the task. It's your duty to teach your child to guard their heart, guard their mind. And you teach them to guard it with truth and faithfulness. You teach them to guard it with honesty and integrity and loyalty. You teach them to guard that heart with love. Those are the things that will guard their heart from the evil things coming in. Teach your children to guard their heart and guard their mind. Number two. Number three. Teach them to obey their parents. And all the parents said, Amen. Amen. Say, amen, Brother Delbert. Say it. <laughs> well, three of you. <laughs> Proverbs 4.10. Listen, my son. Have you ever told your child? Listen to me. That's what he's. Listen to me. Accept what I say. Do what I say. You better. Listen, my son. Accept what I say. And the years of your life will be many. Isn't that interesting? It's the first commandment with promise that if you obey your parents, you'll live longer. Uh, Bill Cosby, remember? I brought you into this world. (laughs) But they live longer. There's something about obedience to parents that makes life longer. I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. Too frequently, though, isn't it true, parents, that your children just don't listen to what you say? They don't accept what you say. So how do you teach them? (laughs) How do you teach a child to listen to you, to accept you? It's time for discipline, Dad. And, Dad, you should be the number one disciplinarian in your home. I was telling somebody this morning, I can't remember one time my daddy spanked me. Now, my mama would wear me out. But my daddy never spanked me, and I was telling him, I don't think that was good. I don't, I don't think that was good that my daddy never spanked me. Now, when I was probably 10, 12, 15 years old, I probably thought that was pretty good. But here I am, 60, and a lot wiser. And I don't know if it was really good. You are the primary disciplinarian, Dad. And what you've got to do is if you love your children, you will discipline them. Proverbs 13, 24, those who spare the rod 
That's pretty strong. Those who spare the rod hate their children. But those who love them are what? Diligent. They're quick. They're serious about this. Diligent to discipline them. Proverbs 10, 13. Wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning, but a rod is for the back of him who lacks judgment. When your child lacks judgment in doing what you say do, you're trying to lead them down the paths of goodness and life and have a, have a good life, a safe life. When they won't do it, then it's time to bring the rod out. And dad, that's your, that's your duty. You're primary there. Now, I'm not saying mom doesn't too, but, but you dad should take the lead in this. It's your duty, dad. And, and if, if, they, if they will obey you, hear me now. Let me, let me do it the other way. If they will not obey you, they will never obey God. In fact, they'll go through life in rebellion. Rebellion to every authority. If they obey you and mom, they will obey God. And they're going to have a much better life and a longer life. <laughs> Teach your children. Teach your children to obey their parents. Um, and, and, and another thing is, is that when a child is disobedient, when they won't obey then a lot of times this, this individual will turn out bad, a disaster actually, a spiritual disaster for sure, but also a social disaster, and oftentimes a criminal adult. Simply because, Dad, you didn't discipline. Number three. Number four, teach your children to select friends carefully. Carefully. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians. I'm going to go back to Proverbs. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be misled. Underline that thought. Don't, let your, don't be deceived into thinking that it, this is true for all these other kids, but it's not true for mine. Mine won't get caught into this. Do not be misled. Don't think that you're going to get by with it. This is true for every single person. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. You hang around the wrong folks, what's it going to do to you? It's going to corrupt you. It's going to mess you up. Your children cannot rise above. Hear me now. Your children cannot rise above their acquaintances. Few people have the ability, have the capability to elevate themselves above the group in which they function. That's where they're going to level out. It's around the people they hang with. And you have to help them learn. Hear how I'm saying this. Not just to have friends. Anybody can have friends. What you have to teach your children to do is how to select their friends and not let their friends select them. Let's say it again. Select their friends and not let their friends select them. Proverbs 1, verse, beginning at verse 10, gives us this, this teaching on peer pressure and how it works. So I want to I I read this to you. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 10 says, My son, if sinners entice you, that would be much better said when. They will, right? They will be. We all have been. When sinners entice you, do not give in to them. If, they say, <laughs> come along with us. Let's lie and wait for someone's blood. Let's waylay some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole, like those who go down to the pit. We will get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot with us. Come on, hang out with us. Be with us, and we will share a common purse. <laughs> you sure will. My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths. Don't hang with this. Don't run with these people. Now, of course, it's talking here about peer pressure. It's talking about a gang. But though this is the extreme gang, this is the really bad gang, we all had our gangs, didn't we? We all had our bunch. We all had our folks that we ran with. And they're these people that we run with put peer pressure on us, and they're going to put it on your children. Do not be deceived here. Don't, don't think that they won't have effects on your children. They're going to have effects on your children as well. There's tremendous peer pressure put on your child every single day to conform to the group in which he runs. That's what they're, they're putting. They're putting this pressure on them to conform to the standards of these people. And you, Dad, got to teach them, don't do that. Don't do that. Teach them... They're going to have peer pressure, but, but, but teach them to get people that puts peer pressure on them to go higher, not lower. 
People that will push them up, not pull them down. Teach them to select their friends, not let their friends select them. Proverbs 18, 24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. What's this saying? Listen, the guy who goes around and everybody's their buddy, they run with this one, they run with that one, and they run with this one, they run with everybody, they're all these, they got all these friends, they're, they're going to get in trouble because at least one of those guys are going to take them the wrong way. You're going to get in trouble. You run with the wrong folks is what he says. It's better to have one person, one deep relationship, one person in your life, one deep person who you can, you can depend on, who you know is going to lift you up and pull you up, and that you can be accountable to that person. It's better to have one than a bunch. It's better to have a few than many. Teach your children to guard, to guard that part of them, to select their friends cautiously and carefully. That's number four. Number five. Teach them sexual purity, sexual responsibility. And there are many responsibilities to sexual activities. I'm going to read you the Proverbs, Proverbs 6.26. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. And the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. And it's the same with a girl as well. You know, you hang around, girl, a whorish man. A whoremonger is going to mess your life up. It's going to reduce you to nothing. The life you could have had is gone. So, parents, dad, understand that your child grows just like you grew. And inside are all these growing passions. These physical desires that they're going to be experiencing. And if you don't train them to control those passions, then they're going to have tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. They've got to control that. Don't get caught in wrong spots and compromising situations. Girls, don't catch yourself in the back seat of the car. Boys, keep your hands to yourselves. Am I right? Teach them. You've got to teach them. You've got to tell them. You start fooling around with, with, with her, <laughs> you're going to do more. Keep your hands to yourself. Stay out of that back seat. I could tell you stories about my daughter. I was so proud of her. She'd get out of the car. She'd walk home. Don't put yourself in compromising situations because it's not going to end out, up good. Boys, when you get around a girl who's loose, who's easy... You better run from her. You better stay away because you're about to mess your life up. Girls, same way. You get around a boy, he won't keep his hands to himself. You better run. Because daddy's going to come and kill him if you don't. <laughs> well, your brother, yeah. Teach a child that if they will guard their purity, then they're going to be proud of themselves. They're never going to have those regrets. And teach your child there's special blessings for those that do. God will give them special blessings. That's number five. Number six, teach your children to cautiously select and then enjoy their spouse. Cautiously select and then enjoy their spouse. Let's look at Proverbs 5.18. May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. That's the selection part. You're blessed when you, when you have a spouse. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. That's the enjoying part. It's okay, you can... <laughs> may you be captivated by her love. Sexual relationships are always forbidden prior to marriage, but then they're exalted after it. That's what the Bible teaches. Man, enjoy it. Be cautious with the selection, but once you've made the right selection and you've got the right person, then drink it up. <laughs> and he relates, he relates this to a fountain. And we don't get it because water is so available to us. Uh, you know, we just turn the spigot on. But in those days, water was not available. Water was not that ready and not that pure. And especially in a community, all the water got got defiled and so there was pure water was extremely 
extremely rare and, and, and extremely precious. And so if you own property that had a fountain or a spring on it, then you were blessed. You had something rare. And so he's likening that to the spousal selection. That man, when you get a good one, oh, wow, enjoy it. Oh, wow, consider yourself blessed and, and consider yourself as having something rare. And especially in our society today, how rare is that? How blessed is a person? And so what he says is when you do this, then, then, then lock in, man, understand. And make the correct selection. It's a precious thing. Fathers teach your children how to select their spouse wisely and then teach them to enjoy their spouse by how you enjoy yours. Let them see you give affection and praise your, your, your wife and praise their mother. Proverbs 18, 22, he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. So you get blessings when, when you're married that you won't get any way else. When you have a spouse like that, God puts his favor on you and, and you need to teach your children to praise her and, 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 and love her, love mom. Especially if she works hard and especially if she's really good and faithful to the family and, and loves the family. Uh, virtuous woman teaching in Proverbs thirty one twenty eight says this, her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Let your children see you enjoy your wife by praising her. Teach your children the beauty. Teach your children the wonder and the blessedness of marriage and enjoying your spouse. Number seven, teach them to guard their mouth. Again, all the parents say, Amen. have you ever said, shut your mouth? <laughs> teach them how, that's good, no, no, I, that's what you should do. <laughs> Proverbs 4, 24, <laughs> put away perversity. What is perversity? How about profanity? Would that be, kind of be something perverse? Profanity. Put away profanity from your mouth and keep corrupt talk. What is that? It's like lying. That's like, blast, that's like talking negatively about people, slandering, putting people down, uh, the corrupt talk from, from their lips. Many of us struggle today, many, especially probably some of us men, with profanity. It slips out. We get disgusted. We get discouraged. Something happens. Boom. Something comes out of us. And whoa, I hate that. And, and you know, where do we get it from? Most, most, most of us, where did we pick that up? Usually from our father. It got into our heart. And we were talking about the heart earlier. And once it gets into your heart, it's very hard to get out. You see, it becomes a part of your ID, your DNA. It gets in there. And, 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 and it's hard, it's difficult to get rid of. You fight it for the rest of your life. Hmm. Same way with corrupt talk. When, people, when, when, when a person begins to slander people and talk negatively about people and lie and be deceitful with their talk, then it's very difficult to stop that person from doing it. It becomes a part of them. He's a liar. See, it's, it's in him now, and, and it's very difficult for him to tell the truth. So... This is what this, this is saying. And Father, you've got to do this. You've got to teach them. And see, the same goes with, with, with the lips. For negative talk, it's very difficult to change once it begins. Proverbs 10, 21. The lips of the righteous nourish many. They're not to, they're not to talk about people. They're not to put people down and, and bring them negatively down. It's, it's to positively push them up and, and nourish them. But fools die from lack of judgment. Proverbs 10, 32. The lips of the righteous know what is fitting. You know how to encourage people. You know what is fitting to say in a situation and what not to say. But the mouth of the wicked, only what is perverse. Um, have, you, have you heard perverse? When, when you hear your kid using profanity, when you hear them lying, when you, when you hear them talking about people, you know, stop them. You've heard the term, wash their mouth out with soap. I, I think that would work. <laughs> you probably wouldn't have to do it, but once. Teach your children to use their words to bring healing to people, Proverbs. That's what it's telling us, Proverbs 10, 11. The mouth, watch, watch the contrast here. The mouth of the, of the righteous is a fountain of life, but violence overwhelms the mouth of the wicked. Your child's mouth will, will be a fountain of life or a fountain of violence. Proverbs 10, 18, he who conceals his hatred has lying lips 
And whoever spreads slander is a fool. Don't let your child be a fool by letting them talk about people and slandering them. Make them. Teach them. Stop talking about that. Stop saying negative things. If you've got anything to say, make it positive. Or don't say anything at all. Teach your children how to guard their mouth. Number eight. Teach them to pursue work. Notice how I say that. Anybody works. If you held a whip over them, you can make anybody work. Just about. But pursuing work. What do, what do I mean? Find something they love to do. Find something that's enjoyable to them and pursue after it. Pursue work. Proverbs 6, 6 talks about an ant. How we can learn from an ant. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler. What's that saying? It doesn't really have a boss. Yet, it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. Teach your children a couple of things from this particular passage. Number one, teach them to self-motivate. Don't cause somebody to stand over you with a whip to do your job. But the way you really will do that is doing something you really love doing. Nobody has to make you do it then. You just love doing it. It's really not work. It's kind of like fun. You know, teach your children to self-motivate. If they're going to be successful in life, they've got to self-motivate. They've got to get themselves out of the bed and get to work. And get to work not on time, but a little early. Hello. Teach them that, and they're going to watch you do it, Dad. You talk bad about the boss, you talk bad about work. Come on, help them a little bit here. The second thing that we see is, is, is that not only do they not need a boss, but, but they plan ahead. It says here that the ant knows winter's coming. So what they work hard while the work is there, while the harvest is there. They store up food. You need to teach your children not to spend every penny they make. Put some back. There's going to be a day coming when you won't have it, and you need, it's wintertime, and you need a little laid back for you. Teach them early to start saving. Teach them early to put some back. They're watching you again. Teach them well. Teach them how to do that. And the third thing that we see here is get out of bed. He says, why are you laying there? I watch parents say they just let their kids just do nothing. Play video games all day long, lay around in the bed. No, man, give them jobs to do. Cut grass, get out, do something, clean the house. Be responsible. Don't let them be a sluggard. Get them up. Get them going. And if you do, then they're going to become good people. Because the opposite of the sluggard is the person who is self-motivated, who goes to work, who gets there a little early, who rises to the ladder and and goes someplace in life. It's the person who who, who finances their their, their finances well, who, who, who manages their finances well. They, they save up, they, they budget. It's, it's the person, it's the person who, who gets up and gets going, self-motivated, gets out, gets out of bed, not lazy. It says they become wealthy, Proverbs 10, 4. Lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. You do it right, you do it diligently, you become wealthy. Teach your children to pursue work. Find what they love to do and make them, get them to do it. All right, number nine, teach them to manage their money. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Then, 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 then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. It's so interesting to me. I see so many people say, man, I believe the Bible. And they do. They believe the whole Bible except for this one part, the money part. And then they become atheist. They, they don't believe that part. The economically atheist when it comes to, 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 to the Bible and what the Bible teaches about money. I don't get it. I really don't get it. They love the Lord, but they don't do that part. And see, it, the, the truth of the matter is here is that if you're generous with God, he's going to be generous back to you. Given it shall be given to you. 
Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give it to your bosom? But also says, you be not deceived. God's not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that too shall he also reap. And if you sow sparingly, you will also reap sparingly. But if you sow abundantly, you will also reap abundantly. So the more generous you are with God, the more generous he's going to be back to you. Teach your children how to give and how to give off the top. First fruits is what it says. It'll make God that important. Make God that important. He's number one when it comes to finances. Teach your children how to give to God generously, and God will give generously back to them. And it's amazing. Over all of my years of doing this, it's fascinating, because, and it never fails. But the people who do give God first fruits off the top, it's, 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 they're not just only blessed. You would expect them to be blessed. But they're not only blessed. It's like everything in life goes well for them. They come out well, number one. But they've got a handle on so many other things in life. It's not just, it's like, you know, they've got savings. When those who don't, aren't diligent with their giving, don't have savings. They, they're never behind on their bills. They always pay their bills on time. Think how this works. They, they've always got sufficient. Things always work out for them. They just got a better handle on life. There's something about giving the Lord, giving to the Lord, that makes a lot of things right. Teach your children how to manage their money. And then number 10, teach them to help the less fortunate. Proverbs 3.27 says this, Do not withhold good from those who deserve it. You don't just help everybody. Those who deserve it, when it is in your power to act, do not say to your neighbor, come back later. I'll give it tomorrow when you have now, when you now have it with you. Now, <clears throat> if you've got the money, you've got the talent, you've got the ability, you've got the time, and somebody is deserving of it, and we talked about this in the Proverbs series, then do it. Everybody's not. You don't help the sluggard. We, we talked about that. You don't help the per- person who runs around taking advantage of people. You don't do that. But, but when a person is honestly in need, and they honestly need your help, and you can do it, teach your children to help. It may be giving their time, it may be giving their money, it may be giving their abilities or something they have, some kind of good, but, but teach them to do it. Because here's why, because generosity and meeting the needs of the poor and people less fortunate than you brings forth a virtue from a person and brings forth integrity from a person. It lets them help somebody else, teach them to assist the less fortunate. Dads, you and I have a lot of responsibilities, we really do. We have, a, we have a big deal to do. It's tough to be a dad and to be a number 10 dad especially. It's tough. It really is. But really, I want to make sure you get this. If you don't teach your children these things, believe me, the devil will. He will teach them the opposites. If you don't, if you don't teach your children to fear God, the devil will teach them to hate God. If you don't teach your children to guard their heart and mind, you can be sure the devil will teach them how to fill their heart and their mind with vile things. Corrupt things. They'll have issue after issue after issue in life. They'll have to face. If you don't teach your children to obey their parents, well, the devil's going to teach them how to rebel and break your heart. Rebel against society and become who knows what. If you don't teach your children to select their friends well and wisely, you better be sure that the devil will pick them for them. The devil will choose them. If you don't teach your children how to control their body sexually, they're going to be taught how to give it over to lust. And that's what everything around us is teaching us to do today. If you don't teach your children how to enjoy their marriage partner and specifically and cautiously select that partner, then you better believe the devil will teach your child how to destroy their own marriage. If you don't teach your child how to guard their mouth, you can be sure the devil will fill it with vile words, be negative talk, talking about people all the time, putting people down. If you don't teach your child how to pursue work, the devil will sure make them lazy. There'll be sluggards and no good. There'll be hindrances to society rather than helping society. If you don't teach your child how to manage their money, be sure that the devil will teach them how to spend it and not just spend it, but spend money they don't have. Be in debt all of their lives. If you don't teach your children how to help the less fortunate, you can be sure the devil will make them focus on themselves. Be low in integrity. Be low in virtue because they are their only thing that they're really caring about. Teach them to help the less fortunate. We have great responsibilities, Dad. And my prayer for each of us 
each of us dads, is that we'll be able to look back one day and say, you know what, I didn't do everything well. Maybe I didn't do everything as well as I could have or I should have. But one thing I did, one thing I did well, I am a good dad. I am a father. In fact, I'm a number 10 father. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that you are father. I thank you you're, you're the ultimate father. Father, I thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you discipline us, that you teach us well. That you teach us all of these things. And if we will do these things, then we're going to have good lives. Father, you're the example, Father. So, Father, now I pray for every man and boy to be father that is here today. I pray for them. And I ask you, Lord God, that they will do these things. Put your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Just want to just challenge you a little bit. Maybe, maybe you didn't have a dad that taught you these things. Or maybe you had a, a good dad, but he just didn't know what to teach you. Didn't know how to teach you. And maybe in your life you're saying, you know what? It's stopping right here. It's stopping now. I am going to be a number 10 dad. I'm going to be there for my kids. I'm going to teach them. I'm going to instruct them. I'm going to be a father. When I get older, I'm going to be able to look back and say, you know what? I did that well. If that's you, would you along with me, you want to make this happen in your life and for your children. If this is you, would you raise your hand right where you're sitting and let me just pray a prayer for all of us. I see hands, hands everywhere, hands everywhere. Father, thank you. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and your, and your love and your, and your kindness to all of us. And, Father, thank you for your discipline. Father, it's your discipline that makes us good. So, Father, I thank you for that. And, Father, I thank you that every single person here, every single man, Father, wants to be the father that you've called them to be. Father, I pray they take these things. Lord, they implement these things. Let it not be just a sermon, just not a teaching, not a Sunday experience. But, Father, it's something that becomes a part of us part of our DNA, that we can teach them well to our children. Your head still bowed, your eyes still closed. Now, some of you are having a tough time in life. Um, It could possibly be because of your fathering. Your dad didn't do what he needed to do, didn't teach you these things. Maybe he wasn't there. Here's what I want you to hear Hear me say today, and I've been talking about it. See, Father God is the ultimate Father. He loves you more than you love you. And he's saying today, you know you're not where you need to be with me, but if you will come and let me be your Father, and if you will love me, then I'm going to take your life, and I'm going to make it good. I'm going to make it come out so good for you. I'm going to put my favor on you. You're going to experience things there is no other way you would ever experience without me. If that's you. And you just know that you're not where you need to be with the Lord for whatever reason. Would you, right where you're sitting, just raise your hand. Let me pray for you right where you're sitting. Hands. See? Hands. Several, 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 several. 